<laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming out. I'm Neil Chase. I'm the CEO of CalMatters. And uh, we are thrilled to be doing this event. This is the time of year when everybody has questions about the elections. It's a time of the year when we work really hard. Our team spends months putting together this voter guide and all the research we do to be able to answer those questions. Our tagline is California Explained, and there's no better time to explain California than we've got a crazy, confusing ballot sitting on your coffee table with a whole bunch of questions that not all necessarily make sense. So we're going to spend this evening explaining some of that to you. If you're not familiar with Cal Matters, we're a nonprofit based right here in this office in Sacramento. We cover state policy and politics. We explain what's going on in areas like environment and housing and health care and state government, state policy. So the people of California who hire this government, who vote for these people, who create and fund this massive government we have that spends $300 billion a year can understand what's going on and be better stewards of it, get more engaged in their democracy. The, uh, the group you're going to hear from tonight is an exceptional group of journalists who've been working on these issues for quite a while. Uh, they're going to share some perspectives. We're going to show you the videos we've done to explain these issues. And then we'll do some Q&A toward the end and uh, get as many of your questions in as we can. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our editor, Dave Lesher. Great. Um, well, thank you, Neil. And thank you all for coming. And get ready to learn a lot. This is uh, the time of year when California asks us to do homework, that we actually have to make some decisions about what we want to do in this state. And so this year, actually, there are seven statewide ballot propositions, as you may know, which is actually a good year. We'd have Most years, we have to do a lot more homework. We think we had 12 in the last election, and then 15 were in 2016, so, so seven should be pretty easy. We're going to get to about five of them tonight, and the other two, they're real quick. But, um, you know, poor San Francisco. I, I, I think San Francisco has 13 or 14 local ballot measures, so those people are going to have to spend a weekend going through the books. Um, so let's get right to it. Like Neil said, we're going to, we're, the format here, we're going to do... Um, our one minute busy video that kind of explains what these propositions do. And then I'm going to talk with uh, the reporters who are covering those propositions for Cal Matters and elaborate on it. And then we will take some questions at the end. So let's first roll Proposition 26. Would you put money on Steph Curry or LeBron James? Want to bet on the Rams winning the Super Bowl again? In 2018, the Supreme Court allowed states to legalize commercial sports betting. Since then, more than half of U.S. states have made the move. Then came a flurry of initiatives to legalize sports betting in California. Two will appear on your ballot. Prop 27, funded by FanDuel, DraftKings, and other large gaming companies, would legalize online sports betting. We have a separate video for that. But there's another. Prop 26. I'll explain. Hi, I'm Grace Getty, economy reporter at Cal Matters. And I'm going to explain Prop 26 in a minute. Prop 26 would legalize sports betting at tribal casinos and at California's four horse race tracks. This prop, funded by several Native American tribes, would also allow tribal casinos to start offering roulette and dice games. If it passes, Prop 26 will allow anyone to sue for certain gaming law violations. Analysts estimate Prop 26 could generate tens of millions of dollars for the state annually which would first fund schools and gambling regulation. Any money left over would go to the state's main fund and also fund things like mental health programs. Opponents are led by card rooms, which offer games like poker and pie gao. They say this idea would trigger more lawsuits against them, leading to lost jobs and tax revenue. Supporters say it will increase tribal self-sufficiency and draw more business to tribal casinos. Vote yes if you want to allow sports betting at racetracks and tribal casinos and you want tribal casinos to add roulette and dice games. Vote no if you do not. One not so small disclaimer. If both sports betting initiatives pass, it's possible both could go into effect. But in all likelihood, a court would have to decide. In a lot of the country, if you watch the Super Bowl, odds are you saw ads for sports betting. A lot of them. Live in-game yeah. betting. Cut, Lady Luck. That's a little ahead of us there. <laughs> um, so I want to introduce Grace Getty, who is our economy reporter at Cal Matters, um, and she's going to talk to us about Proposition 26. And you probably know that there are two sports gambling measures on the ballot this year because 
they, TV has been saturated with ads for both of these things, which we will talk about here in a minute. So she's, we're going to talk first about Proposition 26, but when we talk about the money, which is really the most staggering part of this, this issue this year, um, it, the money is really mixed about, you know, some of the committees are yes on this and no on that, and so we'll just talk about the money for both of them at once here. So Grace, um, we're setting a huge record this year on, on finances for these two measures, so why don't you help us understand how much and where it's coming from and things like that. Yeah, so I think, you know, in California we're used to seeing big numbers, uh, but I think even by California standards, it's pretty remarkable. So if you take all of the different campaign committees that are either supporting or opposing one of these two measures and combine how much they've all raised, it's $447 million, which is a lot of money. <laughs> and and it, you know, it's broken proposition campaign fundraising records, not just by a bit, but by a lot. So the previous record was that set in 2020, and that was $226 million. Um, raised to support and oppose Proposition 22, which was the gig worker um, proposition. Um, so that we're almost, we've almost doubled that record. It's just totally, totally blown past the record. Um, as Dave mentioned, you know, breaking out the <laughs> breaking out the money is a little bit complicated because some of the committees are for one and opposed to the other. Normally, when you have campaign committees, they're like no on Prop 26 or yes on this prop. We've got a bit more commingling with these two, but. Um, the gaming companies and proponents of Prop 27, the online sports betting proposition, have kicked in about 170 million. Um, tribes are, you know, there are some tribes that are just no on one prop. There are some tribes that are yes and no, so it's a bit harder to characterize. And then card rooms, which are opposing the tribes' in-person sports betting measure, have kicked in about uh, 42 million, um, opposing 26. Yeah, it's just unbelievable. I mean, you know, like you said, we have big numbers, but 440 million, in fact, it could go, I mean, there's been speculation about going up to half a billion dollars for, for two ballot measures, which is just incredible. So, um, so you know, Pro, um, Proposition 26 will allow you to bet on sports in uh, tribal casinos or on the four private horse race tracks in the state. I think there's none near Sacramento, <laughs> Golden Gate, and De Del Mar, and Santa Anita, and Los Alamitos, I think. Um, anyway, um, the, so the, the, the question, you know, most of the, a lot of the commercials against the measure are really about the, the card rooms and lawsuits against card rooms. So why, what's, all, what's that all about? Yeah, so this is kind of n not even necessarily the central part, like when you think about legalizing sports betting. This is just kind of another thing that's in the proposition. Um, and it's a new mechanism, basically, that would let private citizens and private lawyers bring lawsuits to enforce gaming laws in California. Um, and, and that's kind of the central reason that card rooms are opposed to the proposition. It wouldn't be a total free-for-all. There's like a kind of process embedded in the proposition. So before someone could bring a lawsuit, they'd need to try and get the State Department of Justice to take action. If the Department of Justice doesn't take action, then they can basically move forward. Um, but the spokespeople for Prop 26 have made it pretty clear that, that tribes would intend to sue card rooms over the particular kinds of card, card games they're legally allowed to offer. Um, and the card, the card rooms, for their part, you know, say that this will unleash um, a, a bunch of what they call frivolous lawsuits against them, and they, they claim it'll drive them out of business and hurt the city budgets of you know, these cities that they're located in. Um, so that's kind of the, the lawsuit process that's embedded. Yeah, and yeah, there, apparently there's a lot of, um, I mean, the question is how many how many card games are at card rooms that shouldn't be there, and how many people and yeah, would exactly sue the card what rooms? And constitutes a house banked card game, and yeah. it's like if some if you're not already into card gambling, it's stuff that you maybe never thought of, <laughs> but, but if you have a stake in it, <laughs> yeah, there's about 84 card rooms in California, so there's a you know there's a, there's a lot of money there. Um, so lastly, just help us with you know who's who's on the 
both sides get this. Who's against it? Who's for it? Who are the supporters, opponents, newspaper endorsements? Sure, yeah. So, I mean, both propositions have, you know, you go to the campaign website, you'll see a pretty long list of public figures and organizations that support and oppose each proposition. Um, in both cases, you know, in, in some ways, the most important supporters are the people who are paying for the propositions. And so I think, I think I covered this in the video, but for Prop 26, that's about a dozen tribes are largely paying for the proposition. For Prop 27, the online sports betting proposition, it's about a handful of large gaming companies. Um, in terms of the opposition, um, there are about 50 tribes and tribal organizations opposed to Proposition 27. Um, there are a few tribes supporting Prop 27. So, you know, that's if you see tribal leaders in the Prop 27 ads, like there are three tribes that support Prop 27, about 50 opposed. Um, in terms of political parties, both the Democratic and Republican, California Democratic and Republican parties have come out opposed to Prop 27. On 26, the in-person sports betting, only the Republican Party opposes. The Democratic Party has stayed neutral. Um, and then kind of across the board on newspaper endorsements, um, you know, the, the newspaper editorial boards that, that make endorsements, um, a lot of newspapers have come out with, with uh, being opposed to both. So LA Times, San Francisco Chronicle, San Diego Union Tribune, Sacramento Bee, I think there are actually some more, but those are the, those are the four I wrote down have all come, come out with um, dual opposition to, to both. Great. All right, so let's do Proposition 27, the video. In a lot of the country, if you watch the Super Bowl, odds are you saw ads for sports betting. A lot of them. Live in-game betting, lady luck, likes to gamble. But if you're in California, betting on sports, besides horse racing, is illegal, at least for now. In November, Californians will vote on two different initiatives to legalize sports betting. Prop 26, funded by Native American tribes, would legalize sports betting only at tribal casinos and horse race tracks. We have a separate video for that one. But then there's another, Prop 27. Hi, I'm Grace Getty, the Conway reporter with CalMatters, and I'm going to explain Prop 27 in a minute. Prop 27 would allow online sports betting outside of Native American tribal lands. It's backed by some of the biggest names in online sports betting. If the measure passes, tribes could offer online sports betting. Gaming companies could as well if they make a deal with a tribe. Operators would pay fees and taxes to the state. State analysts estimate Prop 27 could generate hundreds of millions of dollars annually for California. Most of that would be dedicated to homelessness and housing. 15% would go to Native American tribes that are not involved in sports betting. The measure also creates a new arm of the state justice department to regulate online sports wagering. Opponents say online sports betting could increase the risk of gambling addiction. They also argue the bulk of the profits would go to gaming companies in other states. Supporters say it would create permanent funding to remedy homelessness and would boost funds for tribes that don't offer sports betting. Vote yes if you want to legalize online sports betting. Vote no if you don't. Great. Um, <laughs> so this is the this is this feels like more the game changer in California. And when it comes to the, how California operates gambling, you know, I mean, to have gambling at the casinos, it's all there's already gambling there, but this would make it available to every adult on your phone, anywhere, anytime. Um, so. There's a lot at stake, and so Grace, help us understand, you know, how much is at stake, how much money is involved in gambling, and what what people think about when it comes to the market for sports gambling. Yeah, so I mean, I think this is the heart of why you're seeing all this campaign fundraising. Um, I'll talk about how, how tribes think about what's at stake first, and then get to the business of online sports betting. The tribes, for the tribes that oppose it, I think, you know. The status, quo, the, the status quo is that they have the right to offer certain forms of gambling exclusively, slot machines, house bank card games. And so I think they see um, gaming companies being able to offer online sports betting, even though tribes would be involved, as a kind of a threat to their um, that exclusivity. And for some tribes, their casinos, and perhaps many tribes, I don't know for sure, but at least for some tribes, their casinos are their main source of revenue for funding public services. like basic public infrastructure, roads, 
like health services. Um, and so th they've got a big stake in at least, either not in changing the status quo or at least protecting their exclusivity. Um, so that's why they're willing to spend a lot to try and defeat this measure. On the other side, you have these gaming companies that, for whom California is a huge business opportunity because a lot of states have legalized online sports betting, but California is just such a populous state. There are so many people, so many sports fans, translates to a lot of potential bettors. Um, and so one, one estimate I got from a gaming research firm in August was that if Prop 27 passed, it would probably bring in about $3 billion um, in gross gaming revenue per year industry-wide. And so that would be gross gaming revenue is all of the wagers minus all of the winnings. Um, $3 billion is a lot of dollars, though. Um, so, you know, that's kind of, it's suggestive of why they're willing to spend so much to try and make this proposition happen. Um, and there's this possibility for further expansion of online sports betting kind of embedded in the prop. Um, it would create a pathway to legalize other forms of online betting that aren't strictly sporting events. So there's this possibility of expansion. Um, so yeah, that's those are the stakes. <laughs> so so we were talking earlier about the possible expansion and and betting on reality TV is actually one of the things that might expand, which just I mean that's just so California, right? Um. <laughs> right. So it's it's like part of the definition of sports in the prop. I hope I'm getting this all right. Is basically uh, competitive or novelty of non-athletic competitive or novelty events and. Um, those aren't automatically allowed. There's like this kind of process where this, the State Department of Justice would need to decide to allow it, but um, it wouldn't necessarily go back to the voters. So, so here's the, to me the punchline of this whole thing. After a half a billion dollars or smoke close to a half a billion dollars spent on this, um, what are the polls saying are gonna might happen here? <laughs> yeah, so it's looking pretty likely that they will both fail. Um, so, so one poll, going back to September, one poll just asked about Prop 27. This was from the Public Policy Institute of California. They found that 54% of likely voters were opposed and 34% supported. And then a more recent poll that asked about both um, from the LA Times and the Berkeley Institute of Governmental Studies in early October um, also, also made it look like it, there wasn't a great chance of either proposition passing. Prop 26, 31% um, of likely voters supported, 42% of likely, 42 were against, 27 undecided. Um, on Prop 27, you know, 27% of likely voters said they'd vote yes, 53% said they'd vote no, and 20% were undecided. Um, so yeah, it's been a lot of spending for, for it seems like, you know, relatively unlikely to pass. There are a couple of interesting finding in these findings in these um, polls as well. It was pretty broad across all demographic groups, the opposition to Prop 27 besides uh, voters under 30, so young people. Um, the opposition to Prop 26 was not quite as broad based. Um, the, the margin that Democrats were opposed to it was a bit narrower than Republicans. So if these go down w real quick, yeah. what might happen? Um, if, mm, <laughs> don't know for sure. I don't think this is the last we'll hear about sports betting in California. Though. <laughs> <laughs> I had to take yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's roll a bit video for Prop 28. When school budgets are cut, art and music classes are often the first to go. But a coalition of educators, labor groups, musicians, and Hollywood actors say arts and music are just as important as science, math, and reading. In November, California voters will decide if the state's yearly budget should mandate about $1 billion more for arts and music education. Hi, I'm Joe Hong. I'm the K-12 education reporter for Cal Matters, and this is Proposition 28 in a Minute. Today, the state requires all of California's public school students to get some form of art instruction. But the quality of education can vary based on where you live. So Prop 28 was designed to give more money to districts that serve more students living in poverty. This measure won't raise taxes, but it will affect the budget. By law, California guarantees that about 40% of the state's general fund goes to education. Prop 28 would add 1% to that and dedicate it to arts instruction. For next year, that comes out to about an additional $1 billion. Districts will need to use most of that money to hire teachers for art, music, or drama. 
Supporters of the measure say students need the space to express themselves now more than ever to overcome the mental health challenges brought on by the pandemic. The money would come out of the state's general fund, which currently has a surplus of nearly $100 billion. So for now, supporters say they don't anticipate any cuts from elsewhere in the state budget. Heading into the fall campaign, no individual or organization was spending money to oppose the measure. So vote yes if you want California to give more money to schools for art and music. And vote no if you don't. So uh, Joe Hong, our education reporter, isn't here, and Emily, <laughs> Emily Hoven is uh, our, Run, our political yeah. writer, newsletter <laughs> writer, who, um, who is doing the Joe job today. Um, uh, and you know, we're, we're, we just went from talking about this gargantuan fight of all this money, and so Emily, what kind of a fight is there on Prop 28? There's no fight at all. Um, as Joe said in the video, no one is spending money against this campaign. There's no organized effort to bring it down. There have just been about two newspaper editorial boards that have written actually pretty scathing editorials against this measure. Um, their rationale is kind of interesting. As you saw, the state would basically be required to spend an extra slice of money on arts and education in public schools. Um, and that money would come out of the general fund, which you know goes to healthcare and other social safety net programs here in California. And so the Mercury News and the San Diego Union Tribune basically said that if we're headed into a recession or into an economic downturn, which is looking more and more likely here in California, we're seeing the governor and lawmakers express concern about, about that, um, basically, that would be less money for those other programs, and it would be required to be spent on arts and education um, in the schools. Uh, so we're seeing that, but the supporters um, have raised about $10 million, um, and they are led by uh, Austin Butner, who is the former superintendent of Los Angeles Unified School District, uh, the largest in the state, second largest in the country, um, and he said he was motivated to, to do it because working in the school district during the pandemic, he saw how much kids were suffering and how much they needed that outlet and that release um, that maybe other subjects don't provide. Um, and if you've seen ads for this, you probably have seen rappers and actresses and other famous people coming out supporting it. Fender, has give, the guitar company, has given a lot of money to support it. Um, and they basically say that you know California has a massive creative economy and we need to train students to you know write and act and things like that, sing, play music, so they can come work for us in the future. So, um uh, school finance is like one of the most complicated parts of the California budget, you know, partly because we have Proposition 98, which kind of sets a, a, a floor for how much the state has to spend on schools. Um, but, you know, help us understand how this proposition would fit into the budget. Yeah, so it basically, there's already, as the video said, about 40% of the general fund is already going to schools. It's billions of dollars. Um, and this would just add a 1% amount, of whatever, because that, that changes year to year based on taxes and things like that, revenues. They would just take 1% of that and mandate the state spend that on, on arts and music. Um, and most of it would go to hire teachers. Um, so you know there has been some concern as well. You know how is that going to necessarily translate into programs? Um, so about 80% of it would go to, to teachers, and you have the teachers association supporting it. Um, but yeah, the, there just are some concerns as well that you know schools have already received record amounts of money during the pandemic from both the state and the federal government, um, and Cal Matters has reported, other places have reported that a lot of that money has been spent. Um, with not a lot of scrutiny, and people don't know exactly what these billions and billions of dollars are being spent on. I think one school spent it on like an ice cream vet machine or something like that, and of course some of it is for legitimate purposes. Um, but I think there's concern that schools already have a lot of money, and enrollment is declining very quickly. We're at almost record low enrollment. Um, and so if that's the case, why do we need more money for schools if they have so much? They could. Um, just use what they have and allocate it towards arts and education. That was the argument that the editorial boards also made. So I think there is that concern, but um, again, supporters would say that whenever there's budget cuts, arts and music are always the first thing to be cut because you know STEM is prioritized. Um, and so they just say it's really important that this be treated like a priority in our schools. So the billion will have to come from something besides education, and we don't know what that is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If there is cuts, they, they would have, that money would be mandated to go there, and so something else, healthcare, something else would have to see some kind of yeah. slice off. Yeah, so um, tell us, why do the proponents say this is needed? I mean, what, what is, the, 
what's happening with arts and music in schools right now, and what will what difference will one billion dollars make? So they say that right now, um, only one in five schools has an arts and music program, and so many students aren't able to access that. And they also say that the money would translate to about 15,000 full-time, part-time music and art teachers, which is about double the current number that they have. Um, so they say that's why it's, you know, it's really important for them. Um, and in California schools right now, grades one through six, you're required to have arts and music education. Um, in middle school, it's an elective, um, or you can also take it after school. And the state currently spends about $5 billion a year on two after school programs that kind of accomplish the same things. Um, and then in high school, it's not mandated, but it is required to go into a CSU or a UC. Um, and so many students do end up taking it if they're trying to meet those, those entry requirements. Um, so I think they're just saying it would be more equitably spread and you know, more of the money would go to these low-income classrooms, which maybe have less resources right now to fund that type of, those types of coursework. And the endorsements, newspaper endorsements are? All of them support, except for the Mercury News and the San Diego <laughs> Union Tribune, yeah. yeah. Sometimes they split up. Yeah, it's sometimes interesting. Good. Um, all right, let's roll the video for Proposition 1. The landscape of abortion access is rapidly shifting across the United States. Since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in June, ending a nearly 50-year-old constitutional right to abortion, Republican-led states have rushed to restrict the procedure or ban it altogether. California is moving even further in the opposite direction. So this November, we'll be advancing a constitutional amendment. Conference. Democratic leaders want to make the state a sanctuary for abortion, welcoming patients from across the country who no longer can terminate their pregnancies at home. And now, California voters have a chance to enshrine reproductive rights in the state constitution. Hi, I'm Alexi Kossep, state capital reporter for Cal Matters, and this is Proposition One in a Minute. Abortion access isn't going away in California anytime soon. The procedure has been legal here since 1967. Currently, you can get an abortion for any reason before a fetus is viable at about 24 weeks of pregnancy. California's constitution even includes a right to privacy that state courts have interpreted as protecting abortion. But with the end of Roe, Democratic leaders want greater assurances that abortion access won't be threatened by shifting political tides. They placed a state constitutional amendment before voters declaring that people have a right to choose to have an abortion and a right to choose or refuse contraceptives. Critics say the amendment would not offer any new protections and that it's merely a ploy to turn out liberal voters. But supporters argue an explicit guarantee of reproductive freedom is important in case legal interpretations of California's constitutional right to privacy change. Anti-abortion advocates also say the language is so broad that it would legalize late-term abortions beyond the 24-week point of viability. Proponents deny that. So vote yes if you want California to add a fundamental right to choose an abortion in the state constitution. Vote no if you don't. So as the video said, Alexi Kossoff is our capital reporter um, who's covering Proposition 1. Um, and just to elaborate, there's a quick reference to this in, in the video, but you know, obviously, like, like I said, there's, California already has strong protection for abortion rules in, uh, in the state. Um, so why was this necessary? Yeah, I mean, this is something that emerged very quickly in the weeks after the Supreme Court decision this summer overturning Roe v. Wade. And um, as we touched on in the video, there, there is a long standing, uh, there are long standing protections for abortion rights in California, not just in law, but in constitutional interpretation through this right to privacy that exists in the state constitution. But given what we've just seen at a federal level, obviously Democrats and other supporters of abortion rights in California are very concerned about the possibility that there could be changes in how that language is interpreted in the future. And so they figured now is the time to put an explicit right to abortion as well as contraception and other kinds of reproductive freedom into the state constitution so that there's no ambiguity in the future. As a side sort of benefit to that, um, while they were you know, looking for issues that might motivate voters to turn out in the fall. Obviously, abortion rights is a huge one for liberal voters, for women, for a lot of people in the state. So supporters of this initiative have acknowledged that there's also the hope that this will be the kind of thing that gets voters to the polls in a year where there's not a lot of other things that have been very motivating to Democrats. And so it kind of serves a dual purpose there. One is really 
political and one is more sort of philosophical and ideological. So in the video also mentioned that there's a controversy related here, but you know, I, I mean, has something to do with some feeling that this might actually expand, um, uh, you know, the access to abortion or rules for abortion. Um, so what exactly is that controversy about? Yeah, I mean, it, it's an interesting situation that's arisen because the language of the initiative is really quite simple. When you sit down with your ballot and you look at it, you're probably going to see it's about two sentences. But in that simplicity, others have argued it's actually ambiguity or vagueness. And they worry that by putting this right to abortion into the state constitution, that could actually override all the restrictions that exist in the state already. So obviously right now we allow abortions uh, for any reason up to the point that a fetus is viable outside the womb at about 24 weeks of pregnancy. But after that, it's only allowed if it is a threat to a woman's life uh, or health. And, and so opponents of this initiative worry that if it's passed, it could allow abortions right up to the point of birth and essentially expand greatly the right to abortion in California. Now, proponents deny this. It's, it's certainly not the intent of what they're trying to do, and it's not anywhere in the language that it would do this. So if that is the ultimate outcome, it would only be after a court fight in which somebody sued in order to have an abortion after 24 weeks of pregnancy, and the court said yes, actually what this constitutional amendment does is throw out every restriction that has existed in California for decades. So it's certainly not a guarantee that would happen and it's certainly not the intent of the measure, but there is always you know, potential legal questions that could arise. Yeah, well stay tuned. This will, may not be over either. Huh? Um, so tell us about the, the campaign, you know, the money, the people on both sides, the supporters, opponents, things like that. Yeah, I mean, this, you know, we are a state that has obviously been a big supporter of abortion rights for many decades. We're actually just coming out of a, a legislative session where the governor and the legislature put about $200 million in additional money toward expanding abortion access in California, um, including money to help uh, patients from outside the state who may not be able to get abortions where they live to come to California and get help with travel and other kinds of costs. Um, so with all of that, obviously this, this looks like it's headed towards passage. I've seen polling that shows perhaps as much as 70% of Californians are prepared to support it. Um, but there is a very robust opposition campaign led um, in a lot of cases by religious leaders, um, in particular the Catholic Church, uh, which has put forward um, a pretty expansive campaign. Um, bishops have been recording TV commercials. There's been sermonizing from the pews about this issue. It's, it's obviously a very fundamental you know, ideological issue for, for the Catholic Church. Um, but they've been outraised about 10 to 1, um, and pretty much every Democratic leader in the state has come out and endorsed Proposition 1. So when you're looking at the money, when you're looking at the endorsements, and just where the momentum and, and support is, it's really headed toward the Proposition 1 supporters, and, and it looks very likely to pass, probably overwhelmingly. How much money are we talking about? Um, not, not certainly not as much as the sports money <laughs> yeah. issues. Uh, about $15 million that the supporters have raised, including uh, one $5 million donation from one of the tribes in California, which was really quite interesting. They had, they had a press conference one day with Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis, who has been out there uh, really putting her face to this issue, possibly you know, ahead of a gubernatorial run in 2026. Um, and about $1.6 million that the opponents have raised. And again, much of that has come um, not even through direct donations, but through kind of in-kind contributions from the Catholic Church through all of these you know, TV ads that they've created and this other work that they've put into developing this very robust sort of campaign through the network, through, through their network of you know, dioceses and, and uh, congregants and things like that. And how about the newspaper endorsements? Have we seen? Uh, you know, that isn't something I've paid as close attention to. I feel like this is a really <laughs> a much more personal thing. You know, yeah. I mean, it's very interesting when it, I, I think probably more than anything else that people are going to be voting on this uh, year, this one really comes down to your personal feelings about abortion more than anything else. Because 
it's not going to have as much of an impact on the state budget or you know, really changing the law of the state. It's really about, you know, do you believe that this is something that California needs to protect or is it perhaps something that you oppose? Yeah, good. Good, well, thank you. Um, so we're gonna get to one more here. Well, let's roll the video on Prop 30. California, it's known for its stunning beaches, redwood forests, sunny weather, and dirty air. It has some of the worst air quality in the country. State data shows that more than 90% of Californians breathe unhealthy levels of air pollutants. To reduce air pollution and greenhouse emissions, Governor Gavin Newsom has asked the Air Resources Board to ban the sale of all new gas-powered cars by 2035. So, how will the state meet its goal and who's going to pay for it? Voters will help decide this in November. Hi, I'm Maria Lopez. I cover the environment for Cal Matters, and this is Prop 30 Explained in One Minute. Prop 30 would impose a 1.75% income tax increase on Californians making more than $2 million per year. The tax would generate up to $4.5 billion annually. Most of the money would go toward rebates for people buying zero-emission cars and to build more charging stations. Half of that funding will go to low- and middle-income residents. A quarter of the money would provide funding to hire and train firefighters. The measure is backed by environmentalists and public health groups and is funded largely by the rideshare company Lyft. State regulations require Lyft and Uber drivers by 2030 to log 90% of their miles in electric vehicles. Supporters say the tax would generate much needed funding to support wildfire prevention and help accelerate the transition to electric cars. They say the state's top earners should foot the bill since they're the ones most able to afford it. But opponents, including the state Republican Party and Governor Newsom, say Californians don't need more tax hikes because everyone is already feeling the effects of high inflation and surging gas prices. They argue that the tax would drive many residents out of the state to benefit a special interest, rideshare companies. Vote yes if you think millionaires should be taxed to help fund electric car rebates and more firefighters. Vote no if you don't. Good. Well, this is a really important measure. I mean, obviously, climate change is a big uh, issue in California, You're kind of leading the, leading the nation and the world in a lot of the policies that we have. Um, and, you know, one of the striking things, like mentioned in the, in the video, is, you know, you've got the governor and the Republican Party on one side against the Democratic Party and environmentalists on the other side, which is just needs some explanation. So, um, so Nadia Lopez is our environment reporter, as you just saw in the video. Um, why is our Governor Newsom opposed to Prop 30? Yeah, so interestingly, Newsom is on the side of the Republican Party, which has left a lot of people scratching their heads. Um, <laughs> And, you know, he's also against his environmental allies on this. Um, so Newsom does say that this would benefit a special interest, Lyft. Um, as you saw in the video, Lyft basically has to uh, log 90% of its miles uh, with electric cars in about eight years. And they say that without this measure, that won't really be uh, accomplishable because um, it's too short of a time frame and most of their drivers are low income. Um, apart from that, you know, California had a $100 billion surplus last year, and Newsom says, well, you know, people don't need any more tax hikes. Um, the nation's highest income tax rate is here in California at 13.3%, and if we add on this tax, then that would raise it above 15%. Yeah, and it's a, uh, he's trying to raise a national profile, and supporting right. a tax increase is, is a tricky issue. Um, and, you know, California's not only 15% would be the highest, but you know the second highest is 11% in Hawaii, and everybody else is in single digits. So, so we're already pretty high compared to others. Um, so, what? Let's talk about the money. You know, Lyft is getting a lot of attention for you know really sponsoring this and paying for it. And um, you know, what is Lyft putting in? Where's the? What's the total money, and where's the money against it coming from? Right, so Lyft has been one of the biggest supporters and they've donated the most money. Um, as of this week, they've donated 45 million towards this. Um, and then the other large rideshare company, Uber, hasn't taken a stand, so we haven't heard anything from them. Um, and then opponents have spent about 9 million, mostly affluent people who would be affected. Um, and then opponents, interestingly, uh, of the measure, charge that Lyft bought the endorsement of the California Democratic Party um, by donating four million to them in two separate payments, um, so that could potentially, you know, explain um, why Lyft and the Democratic Party are in line with this, and maybe Newsom isn't. That's what some people speculate. Mm -hmm. 
So it's it's not nearly what the sports gambling measure, measure no. is getting. <laughs> not um, at all. Yeah, <laughs> little perspective, um, more down to earth and real. Um, uh, so California does have really ambitious climate goals. Um, you know, I mean, we're supposed to be carbon neutral by 2045, and you know, cars and trucks are like the biggest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, you know, I think one of the biggest questions in this initiative, in the debate, you know, is there's there's all this money that's already being put into incentivizing electric cars and building more chargers. The state state's adding 10 billion, like you said. There's federal money in the Infrastructure Act and the, the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so there will be a lot more money for incentivizing electric cars and building more chargers than there has been in California for, um, to date. Um, so the question is, or it sounds like the debate is, do we need this more? I mean, is this money needed to reach the climate goals? I know that's a hard question to answer. Probably there is nobody knows the answer, but you know right. what, what can we say about it? Right. So California is really ambitious in its goals uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The transportation sector accounts for about forty percent of all greenhouse gas emissions in the state. It's a big chunk, and um, very recently, in the past couple of months, the California Air Resources Board passed a mandate to phase out all new sales of gas cars by twenty thirty five. Um, so, you know, in this year's budget, $54 billion climate budget, um, the state has already committed $10 billion of those funds to go towards subsidizing electric cars and then also charging infrastructure throughout the state. That's over the course of six years. Um, but within that $10 billion sum, just $1.2 billion would go towards low-income people for those two things. So, you know, to compare, the money this measure would raise in a year would fall between 3.5 to 5 billion, and half of that money would go to low-income communities per year. So there's a quite of a big difference there. Um, and yes, there is federal support through the Inflation Reduction Act that would help fund car electric car subsidies. Um, but the criticism here is that many supporters say is that. Um, you know, the money that Newsom has set aside, coupled with uh, federal dollars for low-income people, seems small relative to the kind of investment that's really needed to get the state to be on track to meet its electric car and infrastructure goals by that dedicated timeline. Yeah, electrification of our transportation system is gigantic. I mean, how, how we do that and all the time scale that it's got to happen on and, and especially I think the big question is like you said how do people the low-income people get electric cars when you know there's actually a shortage of electric cars now so the prices are going up so how much does uh, this this grant or subsidy help you know that's why we don't know the answer of how much is really needed um, right. we don't know the price of the cars really yet yeah, I mean, right now, the price of a, an electric vehicle can range anywhere between, you know, a new vehicle can range anywhere between uh, $40,000 to $100,000 plus. So, as we know, state subsidy programs are great, you know, they can help a lot of people. But um, in recent years, funding has run out, and then people are put on wait lists. So the people that do qualify, sometimes they don't get the funding that um, they need to actually be able to afford those vehicles. Yeah, so um, so uh, this looks like it's going to be a close one, right? Uh, help us, tell us what we know about the polls. Right, so um, the Public Policy Institute of California recently polled about 1,700 people in September, and of those, 55% uh, supported it, 40% opposed it, and then the rest just didn't have a stance on it. And then um, the LA Times poll this week showed that 49% were in support and 37 opposed it. So it is quite close. Um, and then both polls, you know, there's a really stark, huge political divide, partisan divide. 70% um, from the Democratic side support and then 70% from the Republican side support uh, opposes. So. You know, that's pretty on par with, you know, how people vote. A lot of conservatives slash Republican people don't like taxes. Um, so this measure really would say, 
you know, this is what we need. Should we tax people who are affluent, making more than $2 million a year, uh, to do it or not? Yeah, I think it's interesting that poll, the, the first poll, the 55% by PPIC, was before Newsom was on TV ads. I mean, he not, not only opposed it, but he's on the TV ads. And then the 49% is after those ads. And so I don't know if that shows what effect those had, but, um, yeah, but 49% for a tax increase is, you know, it's tough to get that. To, it, anyway, it looks close. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe we'll have to gamble on it. Um, um, so we, we, we've got just a, like one, one or two more minutes we're, we're ahead. So I think maybe we'll do just a, a lightning round, me and Emily. On, oh God! On the, the, the two propositions. <laughs> he didn't tell me this, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> the, the two propositions that um, that we haven't gotten to, just real quick. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'll go. The, I'll yeah, go first. Um, so Prop 29 is uh, <laughs> kidney dialysis. Um, it's about. It would require um, that a physician or a physician's assistant be in a kidney dialysis clinic um, whenever there's any treatment going on. Um, right now, there's already a physician assigned to each clinic, but this would require that they, they be there. And this may sound very familiar because it's, this is the third time it's been on the ballot in you know, the last, what, four years. And every time it's lost by more than 60% of the vote. So it's back again. Um, and you know, it's supported by SEIU mostly, the labor union. Um, they are hoping to organize some of the clinics. Um, but um, uh, the, the clinics, obviously, they, the clinics have put up um, $83 million. So even though they've won twice in a row, they aren't taking this for granted. You've probably seen these commercials out, out there about people saying that, you know, the treatment they get at these clinics is saving their lives. And if the clinics close, then, you know, their lives will be in danger. So, so there's, there's quite a bit of money for, um, for that side of the initiative and, you know, I don't, can't imagine, I haven't seen any polls on it, but, um, and all the newspapers have endorsed against it and really been critical of, you know, this being kind of abusing the proposition process even. So, so that's quick and you got, you got like the, I have 20 seconds. <laughs> um, so Proposition 31 um, is a referendum. It's the only refer referendum on the ballot. And basically, it's asking voters if they want to approve, keep in place a law that the governor signed uh, banning the sale of many flavored tobacco products in California. So um, voting yes on that would keep the law in place. And then um, the tobacco industry, they basically spent a lot of money to gather enough signatures to put the law on pause for two years. Um, and they're asking voters to overturn that law, um, presumably to continue selling those products here in California. Um, and you know, a lot of people that um, support the, support the law say that you know it would help kids not get into tobacco so early because the flavored products target them, and also they have been targeted at the black community, specifically um, menthol cigarettes. Um, and then the opponents say that prohibition never works. And um, if you do this, it's just going to go underground and criminals are going to be selling it instead of licensed small businesses. Um, so that's Proposition 31 in 30 seconds, I hope. All right. We did it all through all seven. <laughs> so now we're going to open it up to questions. Um, and are we taking questions online first? or? Okay. Any questions? Just ask the people who go up to the mic so it'll be on the live stream too. With Prop 30, what specifically, does, what specifically does Lyft get for its 43 million? What in the proposition that does Lyft get? Right, so Lyft doesn't get any money from it. Um, you know, they're not directly benefiting from it. But um, basically, what opponents say is that this. If it does pass, then it would help Lyft comply with this existing mandate. Um, but the drivers that work for Lyft, many of them are low income. They would be the ones receiving those subsidies. Um, they would be the ones that would benefit from the infrastructure in their communities. But um, Lyft itself wouldn't get anything. Um, the challenge here is that, well, if they don't get that money, they're going to have to foot the bill. And that's probably why they're really opposed. I mean, they really want to support it. Um, so, 
Yeah, but Lyft itself is not receiving any funds directly. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? Yeah, Ginger, so, you, can, can you help in the microphones? Because this is recording and, and there's a lot of people online. Thanks. Hi, so um, all the newspapers are opposing 26 and 27. Can you tell me what they say about the initiative, why they are opposing it? Then? Oh, uh, you know, I haven't read these ed all of these editorials, and I haven't read them all recently. So I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to mischaracterize them. Certainly, some have made the argument, at least one that I re read recently, made the argument that we already have enough ga gambling in California. Um, we have we have gambling in card rooms, we have gambling at tribal casinos, we have gambling at uh, horse racetracks, and we have the lottery. Um, and and I can't remember all the numbers of the number of each of those institutions, but there are already a number of ways to gamble in California. So one of the arguments I'd read recently is just we already have enough gambling, um, and I can't remember all the other ones. I'm sorry. Good <laughs> but, question but from an editorial we writer. We do have we do have <laughs> them <laughs> we do have them linked in our voter guide. Um, so Cal Matters does a great job at educating us about these hot, sexy issues, and I'm, I'm going to ask about boring stuff. Like, I, because my background in writing legislation in the legislature, there's always the fine print, and I guess I'm wondering, does Cal Matters ever um, kind of do broad-based um, analysis or educational pieces related to the things that are in the you know, sections four and five of the ballot measures that are like, you know, the things about how you can't amend this again without corpus the voters or the ballot box budgeting issues or the, the kind of other ancillary effects that some of these measures have on issues regardless of what the issue is, but just the idea of process and things like that. Yeah, I, you know, I think a, a lot of that is in the voter guide. There are, but in addition to the voter guide, we're also, I mean, these guys are also writing stories about, and some of these stories are exactly what you're talking about. It's that page four or five, you know, kind of detail about what the propositions are doing. And those are the kind of things, if they have any consequences, that, you know, we kind of break out as a separate story. So I'm trying to do is think of an example of a story well, we I did on I think the biggest a, question is probably with these two competing ballot measures on sports gambling and what do they really allow and how would they work together or not if they both passed and I know Grace did a really good piece that breaks down all those kind of very technical questions so that would be a great one to look up online to really <laughs> help you understand sections 9, 10, 12, 25, and 46. <laughs> there are, <laughs> yeah, so the, I mean, the, I could write like 10 more pieces on the sports betting propositions. I'm not sure how big the audience would be for them, but, um, but the, you know, Prop 27 is over, is like the PDF of it uh, is like 65 pages. So they spell out a whole lot uh, of how it would work. And I, I think a couple things worth highlighting, something that I haven't even written a piece about yet, but I think is interesting is that I mentioned, you know, it creates this process for approving other forms of betting on competitive or novelty events, right? And so, like, the headline is it's about legalizing online sports betting, but it creates this process for legalizing other forms of online betting, um, which involves, you know, like, the state justice determined. It's not just a free-for-all, but, like, that that's in there. Um, another thing which I have written about, a kind of secondary effect, is, like, the fees... Um, the licensing fees in the in Prop 27 are extremely high relative to other states that have legalized online sports betting. So for a gaming company, it's like a hundred a hundred million dollar fee up front to come to market in California. Um, and I talked to some academics and experts who said that uh, oh, both a hundred million dollar fee and you already have to be licensed in. I think it's like you have to be licensed in 10 states, right? And this is like a new thing. So there aren't that many companies licensed in 10 states. So some of the experts I talked to were like, this is a way so that small and medium sports betting companies won't be able to come to market. It will limit the competition. Um, so I wrote about that. But yeah, it's a 65 page measure. There are so many interesting things in there. And uh, Prop 26 isn't quite as long. But again, it has these other things like this lawsuit process and um, and it's also allowing roulette and dice games. That's like not even the headline, but that would be a major expansion of tribal tribal casino gaming. So, yeah, there's always some of those details, like you know, reality TV show betting. I mean, really, I 
I didn't know that was possible. <laughs> That's the best part of that. <laughs> that was one of those details. Um, any other questions? We got some online. We have a question, a bunch of questions from our online community. Um, I'll start with this one for Nadia. Uh, this person <laughs> received a mailer today from the California Teachers Association opposing Prop 30. Can you explain their opposition to Prop 30? Yes. Um, so. As uh, we discussed earlier, basically out of the general fund, 40% of that money has to go towards education. Um, teachers, uh, this particular union, they're opposed to Prop 30 because Prop 30 would create a separate fund that wouldn't go into the general fund. So teachers are saying, you know, we're not getting a cut out of this money for education, and that's the main reason why they're um, opposed to it. Yeah, I mean, tax increases usually get divided with schools, and you know this would be a precedent if they if they got it passed without it. There's no other in-person questions. I can just keep going. <laughs> sure. <laughs> this person uh, says, for me, regarding Props 26 and 27, is first and foremost respecting tribal sovereignty. Just so I'm clear, the majority of tribes in California oppose these two propositions. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about the, the tribes' positions? So the majority of tribes don't oppose both. Um, in fact, a lot of tribes support Prop 26. So that's the one that tribes are paying for, uh, like a group of tribes are paying for. That's the one that would allow tribes exclusively and for horse racetracks to offer uh, in-person sports betting. So tribes don't oppose that one. Um, I, think, I think it's like 50 tribes and tribal organizations that oppose Prop 27. And I don't know if that's actually a majority. I think there's I think it's like there's 110 federally recognized tribes in California. It could be 112. It's right around there. So um, it's it's a lot, but it may not be actually a majority. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I forgot what the second part of the question was. Tribal sovereignty. Well, sovereignty. Oh, sovereignty. Um, yeah. So I mean, tribal sovereignty largely it describes the fact that you know most California state laws don't apply to tribes. They are sovereign nations. Um, and that's part of how tribes ended up kind of getting the right to offer these forms of gambling that aren't allowed in the rest of the state, like slot machines. You know, businesses in the state of California that aren't on tribal lands can't offer slot machines. So there are, you know, there are different, there are different, you know, legal setups for tribes and how they offer um, gambling. And since gambling has been legalized on tribal lands, it has become a, a very important source of revenue for tribes to provide services to their members. Yeah, it's interesting too. I think, you know, if this passes, you know, the what the tribes can do at all their casinos, there's 66 of them around the state, are all negotiated with the state in compacts. And so if this passed and they were going to add dice games and roulette and other games that Prop 26 would allow, they'd have to go back and renegotiate it with the state. Um, about what how, exactly, you know, how much money would the state get off that? How much would the local government get off that? You know, what kind of ages are we allowing? What are the working conditions for people? All those kind of things get negotiated compact by compact. So, you know, it's, it's sovereign, but they, you know, exactly what they can do uh, has to be negotiated with the state. Well, thank you all so much for doing this. Before, uh, before we let anybody go, a few things to share. The, all this information is in our book guide. You can see on the sign there, uh, sponsored by the California State Library, which is wonderfully helping us get this voter guide out to all 13,000 librarians in the state so that they can use it with their patrons to come and ask questions. The New California Coalition really appreciate the sponsorship, supporting this and making it all possible. We're also doing a bunch of things to try to get this election information out there. We are doing a, a curriculum project with iCivics, the nonprofit started by Sandra Day O'Connor, to put our stories and their material together in lessons high school teachers can use. So if you know high school teachers are doing government civics classes, uh, we're happy to share that information with you. We're working with high school and college journalism programs to get this into their newsrooms and their curriculums and their conversations. And about four years ago, a library in the Bay Area invited its community in, ordered pizza, and showed every one of our proposition videos and had a conversation about each one. And we love that idea so much that we've stolen it and adapted it. <laughs> and we're calling it Pizza and Politics. We're encouraging everybody to do this. 
get together with a couple people in your family, with the neighborhood, with a book club, with a church group, with a work group, have that conversation. The only thing we're asking you to add to it is take a picture, send it to us. We're trying to show how many people are doing this and how important it is and setting an example that if people will talk about this stuff in California, they'll be more engaged, we'll get more people to pay attention, to understand, to get engaged in the vote. Uh, if you don't already get it, let me suggest that you get our newsletter, What Matters, uh, penned by Emily. <laughs> you can go to our website and sign up for it. It's free. It shows up every morning, which is why Emily is working so hard Sunday through Thursday to get it through you Monday through Friday mornings. Everything we do here is because of your support. If you're in a position to help us on the website, you'll see a place to donate. If you'd like to talk to us about working with us in other ways, Ben Warner, who runs our sponsorships, is here in the back of the room. We do this for the people of California, but we do it because the people of California support us, so we really appreciate that. And this entire event will be on our website. You can watch the stream. Thank you to the hundreds of people who are watching online, to the people who came in here in the room. <coughs> room excuse me. If you are watching online, we thank you. We invite you to go to your kitchen and find something to eat or drink. If you're here with us in the room, <laughs> we're going to have some stuff for you to eat and drink here, which is the, per the, the benefit of being here in person. But thank you all so much for coming out. And thanks, everybody online, for tuning in.